Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a great turnout. Um, my name is Amanda Rainey. I'm down. I'm at the PBSU Art Gallery. I'm our user experience and learning manager, which just means that I get to organize events like this and talk to really interesting people about the work that they make. The GBSU Art Gallery department here on campus includes the gallery that you're in now, as well as a couple smaller wall galleries, both on this campus and the two Grand Rapids campus, downtown Grand Rapids, and of course the art collection that you see in every building all over all of our campuses. We've got multiple campuses across the state of Michigan. Um, here in the art gallery department, we believe that visual art has the power to spark conversations action and reflection on themes, all sorts of themes, including popular culture, the power of art and community building and healing, social justice, and the barriers faced by artists of color working in the state of Michigan, all topics that I think we'll touch on today. I'm particularly excited about this group of artists because of the perspectives that they bring to our campus. We're always working towards building better programs and exhibitions that equally represent all voices and share the work of artists from all backgrounds. And this program is uh, one of many that we'll host in the coming years as we work towards that goal. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator and each of our speakers, and then I'll hand it off to our moderator to begin our conversation. So we'll start with Stephen Smith, who, with his wife Taylor, uh, runs well, first, they co-created and curated the exhibition that you're sitting in now. The other half of this exhibition, yeah, exists at their gallery space called Muse GR in downtown Grand Rapids. A little shout out there. We have another reception at that space tonight from 5 to 7 p.m. And you can follow either at GBSU Art or find Muse GR for details about how to get there. So, Stephen and Taylor. Run Muse GR, which is an interactive art gallery and event space on the west side of Grand Rapids. And through Muse, Stephen and Taylor connect with the communities of doing art and creativity to encourage positive transformation and discovery of one's purpose and passion. Thank you, Stephen. Are we going to Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm going to start with Jasmine. Jasmine Brew. Is a visual artist whose work emphasizes the healing power of creating. Currently based in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and obtained her BFA from GBSU. Props there. Her versatile and powerful style tells the story of a universal trauma that plagued the entire human race. Her work aims to draw out this pain, restoring balance and connection with the inner, outer, and divine self. Jasmine has painted how many murals in Grand Rapids now? Four or five. Yeah, or by quite a few. So you may have seen her work even if you don't know that she's the author of that work. So thank you, Jasmine, for being Bryce Detroit is a cultural designer, a national award winning music producer, performer, and curator. Through his practice, Bryce Detroit demonstrates the power of using music entertainment arts and native legacies to design cultural infrastructure for preserving, producing, and promoting new diasporic African narratives, cultural literacy, and cooperative neighborhood-based economies. He is a 2019 New Museum Ideas Cities Fellow and a 2017 Night Arts Challenge Award winner, among other awards and successes. There's quite a few listed on his website. He's a prominent community activist and advocate. He grows intersectional, self-determined communities as a founding member of Oakland Avenue Arts Coalition, co-founder of Detroit Community Wealth Fund, director of culture at Center for Community-Based Enterprises, and international delegate for the East Michigan Environmental Action Council. Thank you, Bryce, for being here. And finally, we have Chief and McFly down on the end. Oh, I should point out, I forgot to do this, where all of their artwork is in the gallery. So, Chief is directly behind us, Jasmine is here in the corner. We've got the two pieces directly behind my colleague Nicole. Bryce's work is here. And of course, additional work by each of these three artists is on the other place. So, Chibi has swiftly risen to become a promising and commercially successful American artist, muralist, rapper, and DJ. He'll be DJing tonight. As a painter, he belongs to the widely celebrated neo expressionist art movement, emerging, uh, sorry. 
Yeah, emerging from a long line of street smart graffiti artists who successfully crossed over to the international art gallery circuit, McFly established a dialogue with the tradition of cubism and abstract expressionism and alumnus of Detroit's College for Creative Studies. He is very uh, skillfully and purposefully brought together in his art a host of disparate traditions, practices, and styles to create a unique kind of visual collage, one deriving in part from his Michigan-based origins and from his African-American heritage. Thank you, Shifi, for doing that. And with that, I'll pass it over to Stephen. He's got a list of questions, but I'm excited to see sort of the organic quality of the direction of this conversation. Yeah. All right, so I'm really excited to ask you all these questions. Um, but first, we're just going to start basic. Um, we want to know where you're from, how that influences your art. Tell us a little about, about your background and your approach to making the art that you create. No order. Um, for the first question, we'll go in order. <laughs> Peace. It's a pleasure to be here, right in Detroit. My practice is called Entertainment Justice. This is me as a music-based artist, starting off in the conventional music entertainment space, industry space, as a record producer, recognizing that my job in that corporate music space essentially is to produce records that successfully inspire and influence the audience to see themselves in a particular way and to behave in a particular way. So the record producer is behavior science in real life. So for me, it was acknowledging, yo, all of my intelligence is going towards creating content that is inspiring people for new points of consumers, consumer identity. So let's bring this from a diasporic African standpoint. That type of work is it exists amongst the priesthood. The priesthood would be the strata in society that's responsible for creating through material culture the, the modalities that inform our self-identity and our behavior. So it's like, yo, let me stop doing this shit over here because all we're doing is modifying folk for consumerism. Let me bring this magic, this sacred art to my people, in particular by connecting with social justice, environmental justice organizations. And it's like, yo, what are the points of identity? What are the new behaviors that we need to be expressing and projecting from in order to, for real, for real, design this new, this new that a lot of us are working towards? So that 2010 was the start of me entertainment justice. Um, Detroit native. Uh, this is me intentionally trying to be as brief as possible because right from the talk. And that's good. And I, I appreciate hearing that. So one thing I hear you saying, and tell me if I'm wrong, you intend on replacing um social and cultural norm. Yeah. Instead of we we'll use this language and here to assert and affirm ancestral cultural and practical because replacing that's centering whiteness and a foreign society, a foreign culture. And we're not centering actually, we're centering us in radiating out. Yeah. 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 Um, so my name is Jasmine Bruce. Um, I am a visual artist. So I went to Grand Valley uh, for my bachelor in fine arts. Um, so I'm actually in this place right here. Um, and I got my emphasis in illustration. So I graduated in 2018. Um, since then, I really dove into the world of public art. I found a lot of passion within that world. Um, I started live painting at different types of festivals where I was able to meet different people and start to really understand and define what I wanted my artwork to mean. There's a lot of pressure to kind of find your style and your purpose within your artwork. And so after college, that was my mission. And what 
the kind of work that I produce now um, is centered around healing. So using your artwork, whether that's within the practice um, or within communication with other people in the community um, as a mechanism for healing. So as I'm producing my artwork, I am um, processing traumas that I've been through, but I'm also reflecting on traumas and experiences that other people have been through um, in their lives. And I think that is one of the things that is incredibly at the center and core of of my artwork because I understand that there is um, a lot of pain and trauma that we all experience um, and that needs to be processed and lifted up um, out of our internal energy systems, but also like the energy systems in the world. Um, so yeah, that's what I would mainly focus upon. Um, my real name is Tashi Turner. Uh, as a performer, I go by Sheiky McFly, but I'm usually doing art shows. I like to keep it Sheiky, you know. Uh, but a pretty cool guy, born and raised Detroiter, multifaceted artist. Um, I do murals around the city. I do a lot of, um, I guess you could say my upbringing is more guerrilla. I went to CCS for probably like two and a half years when I dropped out. Uh, when I dropped out, that was like a big shift in me. I always wanted to be an artist, so I feel like I just been finding my way. Uh, I'm 33 now, but I dropped out probably like 09. So around that time, that's when I started taking hip hop and rap seriously, and I started throwing parties to keep the, uh, you know, the rent paid and whatnot. So I guess just over my life, the influences I had in Detroit really steered my career in a lot of ways, like me becoming a DJ, learning that techno, came from Detroit was a, a big push for me. So that really led me to producing and DJing. I also produced my own hip hop and whatnot, yada, yada. Um, I stayed in Eastern Market when the first murals in the market happened in Detroit. And that really steered me towards being a muralist. Uh, Cause I seen so many different artists come into Detroit to paint the city, but it just wasn't our narrative. It wasn't our language. So I really put it on my back to um, learn the skills to actually uh, paint a Detroit narrative around the city. So me as a muralist uh, skyrocketed from Detroit and it led me to different cities, uh, different states. Uh, I did Art Prize a few times, uh, did Red Bull House of Art. Um, in Detroit, but a lot of my shows are uh, self-curated. Um, a lot of things are just like random hustles. Like I do like hundred dollar pop-ups. I probably saw like 300 to 400 pieces from here to LA to Miami, just having stuff in my backpack and my luggage are just popping up on the streets and stuff in different areas uh, or in front of my mirrors or whatnot. So I feel like my strength as an artist uh, is really finding unconventional ways to keep moving forward. And I feel like right now where I'm at is maturing with my own art, looking at the things that I made in the past and thinking about longevity, uh, discipline, different ways I can learn as well as teach and getting out of my comfort zone to uh, become a global phenomenon. That was good. It leads me to the next question. Um, so you kind of answered it. So if you wanted to, you wanted to add on anything to this, and then you guys can answer. How do you find? How you define success as a transfer your career? And do you have like long term goals, or do they change as time time goes on? At first, I thought success was like obtaining things I've seen other people do. But once I started uh, reaching those goals and seeing what the limelight was, I see that it dissolves quickly. So I feel like success is longevity, uh, peace of mind, being honest with yourself, honest with your work, because it's not about the money. It's like this rents my soul. Like I feel like painting really rents my soul. It's my therapy. So I really keep that in mind. And that helps perpetuate my career you know like uh, so i guess the long-term goal is living long you know i feel like a lot of artists we're so pushed to live fast and die young or do everything right now like um being an artist isn't instant gratification um it's not an instant million dollars nothing is guaranteed you know so it's just such a 
it's such a pull string on your heart, but it's everything at the same time too. So I feel like just uh, mental stability and health, that's the true uh, success. Everything else falls in line after that. Definitely agree with what a lot of you said. Um, and the defining success over time has has changed for me, but I find that a lot of it stems from being true to yourself and honest with yourself and your work. So um, I've been in months where I'm not quite producing the work that um, reflects who I am. And in those moments, you definitely feel like you failed part of yourself. So I would say throughout it, just being, being through yourself and honest, um, that the artwork is tied so much to who you are as a person. Um, and I know you talked about healing. I know this is a great question, but it just made, hearing you talk about that, maybe you think about it. Your mind space when you make this pain. Would you like to? Is that something you can share? Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. So, this um, painting titled uh, The One on the Wall, or the one that's on the wall. Yeah. The I one don't... that has the ear that pops out. You got to make sure you look at it from the side. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of, um, there's some texture on it. Yeah, I think that's a, a good reflection of where I started to lean into being true to myself and what I, what I wanted to say with my artwork and so veil is kind of the beginning of uncovering this veil um and the veil is intended to be symbolic for the the framework or blueprints that are embedded in, within you when you're growing up from other people from society um that might not be true to who you are anymore. And so as I was beginning to lean into that with my artwork, um, you kind of begin to see what the veil is in front of you and what it looks like and start to name it um, and inevitably begin to take it off too. And that's also when I started to like draw these sort of pipe um, motifs which symbolizes the bunk bed that I had growing up. Mm -hmm. um, it was a red bunk bed. It had these pipes. And it was this moment when I was like five or six. And I really started to think about that. And that my parents were going to die. And that we're all going to die. Um, and that's like a big weight to carry that everyone has to carry um, and accept as well. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is a really important piece to me because it's when I started to explore um my own trauma and reflect on those different veils. So. That's really that's really good. Make sure that you guys go and look at some of her art, even if you just go on her page. Because when I look at your work, I always wonder like did these like when, whatever I'm looking at, I'm like, did this come from somewhere? To hear you say that that was your bunk bed or that's what representation of your bunk bed. It makes you want to like examine and ask more questions of the, about the art that you create. So that thing is the red pipe is even in the one that needs to be. Right. So um, success, um, how do you define it? So for me, the first point of success um, is being able to, not being able to, it's, Rooting yourself, rooting myself in my agency and contextualizing my practice and my work myself. So much of quote unquote African American art or Black art is contextualized by the gallery or by a dominant narrative. And um, and that's just corny to me. It's corny and it's small box. So um that is first and foremost for me. It's like boom, this is my practice. This is my work. These this is my language, these are my definition. You know what I mean? Take it, digest it, spit it out, whatever, but you gotta catch my shit. So that's like success point number one. Um also success looks like it looks like 
go to a doctor. Just with this one project, my road work is really close to Pinterest. For me, on a as an example, for me to have my first national installation in Philadelphia, um, in a historic black neighborhood, um, central district that happened last September. That you know, what I mean, disseminating the culture, disseminating our new culture, and then seeing people not only uh, embrace and have these this idea resonate with them, but to uh, take it on, you know, I mean, buy a shirt, buy a badge, and it's like, yo, my hood is closed to gentrifiers, and then they deputize themselves like that because creating movement. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is there any past art movements that you guys feel like you identify with, or any any project that ever happened that you're like, that was fire? For me, my I would go to music. Um, Gil Scott, um, the poet. Mm -hmm. Like I identify with his music and say, like how you're saying you identify. It? Mm -hmm. Like, is there anything that ever um, that you identify that you? For sure. For me, uh, <laughs> the biggest art movement that's been most influential for me is the black recording industry that existed in 20th century Detroit. That was a cultural economic movement. That movement is what brought the world most out. There were also, like, there were more than 400 record labels on the books in Detroit between 1930 and 1970. Uh, a quarter of those, just about under a quarter, were different Black, managed black owned operated businesses. So it's that movement that reminds me that, you know what I mean? That's that movement that allows me to project on my built environment and be like, yo, that building used to have music economic activity in it that looked like me. That space used to be for blah, blah, blah. That's a few of the few. I think for me, I'd say it's kind of a uh, newer movement um i don't even know if it necessarily has a title but it's the visionary art movement um where you see i think as i go into um like installation work at festivals and such like that um you see these artists really exploring and pushing um different thought processes um and i think that was something for me that really was inspiring um, a lot of my work pulls from different types of philosophies and ways of thinking and being able to like mesh that with my own experience um, was really important and allowed me a lot more freedom within my work. Do you, um, um, do you, do you ever look at Afrofuturism? Does that fall in that category? Yeah, I think naturally as a woman of color, it's going to Implement itself in that way as well. Um, so yeah. Talk about who they inspired by, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about it. Uh, of course, like I have like a evangel like surrealism, pop art, cubism in my work. But honestly, right now, what I'm really inspired by is like Detroit now, like the present Detroit. In the past years in Detroit, it's like there's so much motion and there's so much that's really happening in the city. Like I I talked to so many different people, just different artists, creators, DJs, uh, designers, and everybody's just really changing the world. And it reminds me of like being a child and reading about the Harlem Renaissance. I feel like what's ha what happened in the Harlem Renaissance is happening in Detroit right now. And we won't realize until a hundred years later, like everybody that we're around will really like change in the world, like at this very moment. So I feel like that's like the biggest movement, the movement I'm a part of. Like it's not only Detroit either, you feel me? like it's Michigan really. And that's what's really dope to see like the whole just artistic verbiage just really spreading from city to city. And we're all learning our own language so it can just be heard, not just from one pocket, one subculture, like the whole state. It's really moving like a meeting. Like I go to, like if I'm in LA, you feel like that's all I hear. People talking about Glenn, people talking about Detroit. 
you feel me? People talk about Grand Rapids, you know, like just different producers, rappers. Um, and then just seeing a mural, it's just off, blah, blah. Like it's just, it's just magic. It's feel like a dream, honestly. And that's cool. One of the ways that this the movement, the Black cultural, economic, entertainment movement, one of the ways that expressed itself in the late 20th century was the merge. The merge record underground resistance. Another way that it expressed itself in the 21st century is through the arts, enterprise, and entrepreneurship that she be expressed, the right to Twitter presence. I just want to name that. This, this me just intentionally contextualizing that as its own art movement so that we can expand uh, our thinking in terms of what an art movement actually looks like. Yeah, I, I've been studying. I studied a lot over this past, I'm going to say semester, because it was, I taught a class here at Grand Valley, and I just wanted to delve super deep into art history. Of course, in the books, we're not in the, in the history books as um, artists that's represented up here. And, um, but I always wonder, like, 100 years down the road, what would be in the history books as, as far as Post contemporary or whatever, whatever. whatever. I want to know what's coming next and what it can look, look like in the history. But um, you did speak about identity, um, and that was so. I wrote I wrote some bonus questions, <laughs> and it's like if they came up, I'll ask. I'll ask. How do you guys feel about the labels being categorized like by racial groups like BIPOC or Black artists, African American artists? I was. How do you feel about it? So, um, on an identity tip, because so much of my work is deep and rooted in identity, one of the first, one of the things that I've done for myself in 2013 was create a point of identity, Detroit Avenue. So for me, it was after having a lot of internal conversations as well as dissonance with African American, um, with the different labels that were given to us. Let me tell you, Bryce came out his mama, and this world already had labels for him. And we were we were assigned these labels with no opportunity to really critically question where these labels were coming from. So for me, Detroit African knowledge is two things. One, that there, Bryce. Four generations indigenous to what we call Detroit. Super shout out to the ancestors of that land, Wawiatana, and the Anishinaabe tribe. That's really, we talk about ancestral literacy. Um, but being indigenous to that place means something, for real, for real. And then the African part is because of this, is me acknowledging that Bryce is a part of this diasporic African ancestry that has tens of millions of years old. Years worth of history and legacy, material culture on earth by me creating this. I point of identity, this label for myself, um, very validly, and it allows me to stay connected to it. Places me outside of the colonizer's mirror, which said that, right, you and your people are about a couple hundred years old. You know what I'm saying? Your whole experience starts here. And Go from there, actually. So identity is paramount uh, in that way. Those other labels, this is my last thing, so I'll be the head shaking. But my last thing for me, those other labels, my challenge to everyone who uses them is just to really question who gave you this label for real? Did it come from a point of ancestry or did it come from a point of imperial colonial culture? And what are the implications of us continuing to put labels on us that someone else gets? I, I feel I feel uncomfortable sometimes being I'm I'm emerged in the art culture here in uh, Michigan. And sometimes it might be a rant that comes out, it might be a talk like this, it might be anything, and like I I often wonder where did this label come from? Because it's like, I feel like everybody in the art world knew about it but me. And I'm like, when BIPOC came out, I was like, 
<laughs> and it's like it seems like everybody knew, and these labels always come out, and everybody always it feels like everyone knows. Um, even yeah, and so and I, I'm I'm trying to be kind of professional, but I play a lot. You know? And one of the a question I have this is it's a quick follow up. I made sure you talk on this is a quick answer. Um, when you fill out application. And other do you write what do you write? Um that's what you applicant that's for applicant because usually when you're answering that question, it's speaking on like national group. Um, we'll say real quick on a bypass tip. So from, a, from an environmental justice standpoint, I noted around 2011, we've been in that space for a decade. Around 2011, 2012, instead of black and indigenous, started to see bypass. And that BIPOC frame was allowing funds to that used to go to black work to go to people of color. And people of color essentially meant everybody who's not black or brown on some real shit. So there's an insidious aspect to that label. And it's been under critical question for me and others in the environmental climate justice space for a minute now. Isn't it funny? Is it, from an art perspective, doesn't black mean absence of color? <laughs> or totality of all colors? Answer your question on the identity bucket. Um, I think that it's important to to understand the labels that that you're brought up in, but also understand that you have the power to break them and not be confined to what they tell you that you are. Um, I think that also I have had an interesting experience as a biracial woman, so black and white, um, and falling somewhere in the middle is quite confusing as you're growing up. Um, and so that experience for me has been really interesting, hard, difficult, um, enlightening. Um, and I think I always come back to this like remembering, which is like a remembering of of who you are. So I think there's the part of me. There's two parts of me that feel have always been disconnected in a way, um, especially growing up in Grand Rapids. Um, I've had a lack of being around people that do look like me um, and understanding the Black history and parts of and African parts of myself has been difficult in Grand Rapids because I just have not been exposed to it as much as I choose. Push myself out and expose myself. Um, and you get in a place a lot where your white friends don't think that you're black enough and your black friends think you're too white. So there's this like super um, just lack of identity for sure because you don't feel like you belong to either groups. Um, and that was a big point in this painting on this front wall here was exploring like um, a lot of my trauma comes from from my hair texture, especially as a woman of color. And growing up in school, I always felt like I, I needed to straighten my hair and look like how all of my friends did. Um, and that was super traumatizing for like physically, um, emotionally, and mentally, um, getting your hair relaxed. People don't really understand that whole process of like actually chemically burning your hair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I did it so often that I get these like huge scabs on the head, and I just hated my hair so much. And it's taken me years and years to grow to grow to love that part of myself that was like just unapologetically black. Um, so 
yeah, identity has, has so much to do with what my art group says and breaking those labels and not being confined to what they tell you that they are. I'm trying to think what would be the best way to pinpoint it for myself. I honestly feel like at least a lot of the work I do is on orthodox is it's only so many ways I can be in the galley or something like that. Cause a lot of galleries really don't like me like that, you know. Uh, but I sell my own work. You feel me? Like a lot of times in galleries, they want to uh, split it 50 50 on you. You feel me? You know, they want you to paint a certain piece. Like a lot of the stuff I make is off of the top of the dome. Like it's really a mantra for me. So I've been getting back into uh, having more of a attention span in my work of thinking of what I'm making before I'm making it. But it's really just me being in the moment. So that's what really uh, deters me from filling out a lot of applications and whatnot. But I see the money that they're giving away and everything that we got to fill out, you know. And it's like we got to just emphasize Black trauma and play Hunger Games for this little piece of bread I can make in the streets myself. You know, so like it really, um, I really don't be around shit enough to hear a uh, biopic enough. You feel me? Like I'm, I'm really in the streets just hustling, but I know it's a problem. And the only way we can break it is realize that art has no rules. It has so many rules, but it has no rules at all. And that's what really makes artists insane because we try to jump through so many hoops to be seen by these people or bought by these people or praised by the one percent with these millions essentially they're looking for the coolest thing they're looking for you know the next boss out in the streets that got a needle in his arm you know and we got to get that away from us like just perpetuating trauma it puts you in the wrong head space i feel like um as black people any shade like just how we're all talking you feel like black is not just one shade it's all of us sitting here you know, so even what you was going through, you should never feel that way. You feel me like on some real 100 shit. You feel me because black is different shades and it's all of us, you know, and powers that be fear that. So since they fear that, they try to separate us by having us fill out these long ass applications and give us confusing questions of what are we when, you know, it's, it's not no label to an artist. You either fuck with it or you don't, you know, and, uh, that's how I'm really in the room half of the time. Like I, I don't know how I get half of the gigs, but you know, but like, uh, you feel like there's uh, barriers that's keeping you out of rooms. I don't feel like it's barriers anymore. It's just things I have to learn. Um, it's discipline I have to obtain because um, I don't even want to be in those rooms. You know, so uh, but I know for me to reach where I need to be more than likely I'm going to have to do it myself or it's going to be like mine so that's willing to take a risk on, you know, because I'm, you know, I, I don't want to just talk about myself like it's a horrible dude, but you feel me, I eat what you feel What do you, as an artist, what do you all feel like, if if there's any support that you can get, what would be the support that you would design? I guess it's an uh, open ear. Um, not a consumer here, but somebody that wants to hear what you want to make and amplify that. Usually when you do get support, support sees something that they like and they just want to keep pushing that like a hit song. You hear like Cardi B been making the same motherfucking song for the past five years because people like that song. Or uh, uh, the baby, you feel me, the baby made the same beat, you feel me forever because like the record label hear that, they're like this hot, we gonna keep pressing this button. And we ain't gonna never stop pressing this button. And I feel like artists uh, in today's age, mainstream artists, they don't say no anymore. Or they don't say like, I don't wanna do that. I wanna stick to this. You know, and I feel like artists, when we do get those positions, we gotta learn how to just stick to what we wanna do instead of doing what we're told. And that's how a lot of things are being manipulated and uh, steered now compared to a lot of the artists. You know, they're still themselves. I don't wanna say like they're puppets. But they are perpetuating uh, the record deal. You feel me? So if you got this deal, you're gonna have to do what the deal says. So that comes with art and music, you know. I was in the business organization and stop waiting for things like big movements to happen to highlight black artists. Um because it's 
it just gets old after a while. Um, like the in betweens, people just forget that uh, these people are existing, and that's their experience all day, every day. Um, and so, although, like just thinking back to when 2020 murder of George Floyd, all of that stuff was popping off. People were protesting art movements. Obviously, we had one downtown of the NPR, which I helped lead. So that was essentially taking um, this trauma that had happened physically, um, but then using artwork to speak on that and giving space for Black people to talk about their experiences. And then it was like after that, you had some other opportunities that came up in school. But then after it kind of dies down, it's like no one's really talking about it anymore besides the people that it still affects. Um, so support in the aspect of like stop waiting for those things to happen to support these people. Just input, find ways to implement it regardless of what's going on in the world because this is going on for us every day. Um, yeah. So that is an art movement. Um, I feel like I feel like you have your own art movement. I feel like this is an art movement with yourself. Um, the people, I'm not sure that everyone knows what it is. Like, what is what is what does this mean to me? Really love the nature project, and and how did you get focused on the on the fighting? So, um, and can also weave in um, speaking about support and my response. So um, the this what inspired this project was um, to be very square was in a collaboration from 2014 to 2017 and a half, 2018. This collaboration was with people from outside of Detroit. Um, there were two white, uh, white body people from Ann Arbor. One was associated with U of M and the other was their husband. Um, we collaborated on uh, design times narrative strategy times entertainment justice project. It was in that collaboration. Um, whenever they wanted to disregard a cultural norm, that Bryce was continuing to do. Yo, this is how we identify ourselves. This is how we relate to each other. This is how we interact with our neighborhood, our environment. These are our procedures. These are our protocols. These are our processes. I'm telling you this shit over and over again so that you can choose to be in right relationship with us. One of the things that they would say whenever they wanted to do their own thing, basically, would be like, Bryce, it's hard to respect your cultural norms because they're not written down. It was like, uh, you think that's the most European shit I've heard, <laughs> you know what I mean, in this decade. But um, on one level, on a compassionate level, because this was me projecting from my activist identity a little bit, which is like assume best intentions with everybody. That's a fucking trap door. That's another conversation, though. Um, so me coming approaching from assume best intentions, it's like, all right, where what what's underneath that sentence? And what struck me at first was okay, in European culture, there is a predominance, a priority. For the linear, the linear things. So, guys, these white folks are telling me it's challenging because they don't see the shit written down. No, okay, true. Okay, okay, no. But on another, on a, on a real brother level, and it's like, oh, okay, God, this is you telling me that we're not going to respect your shit whenever we don't want to. So, for me, it was like, all right. We're going to do something 
that set me on this path to make a project where our cultural norms were written clearly and put in the environment so nobody can ever tell my black ass, I don't see it written down. So I can't respect your shit. That's very deep. You know what I mean? So um, the aesthetically, one thing about Detroit is we have a rich legacy of sign painting culture, as well as uh, mission thing, but construction culture. You know what I mean? So those two sign paintings um, and traffic control signs, construction culture aesthetic, those have always resonated all ways. I mean, like, yeah, there's, there's probably many folks in Detroit who at some point have had an orange car park package. We get that shit through seeing them out the streets in the first time. So uh, I started this project in 2019 called Road Work. And for me, this was, it was me about to basically create this project. Hadn't even thought of it signed yet, but it was all from a spiritual standpoint first. But could Road Work for me speak to this? The journey, the path that each one of us are on, our road, there are, there's a fundamental work, the work of, real quick tagline, as above, so below, on earth, as it is in heaven. That's the tagline for road work. So it acknowledges that the work that we do on our road that happens in our heaven, in our imagination space, this is the work of cultivating identity. This is the work of creating our self-image. This is the work of imagining ourselves successful, self-actualizing. It's the quality and the diligence of the work that happens in our heaven that directly speaks to how we're going to actualize on earth. So, road work. So, right on that, like, yeah, bro, we're going to make songs and spiritual ha ha ha. Um, and so, we're like, boom. Um, because we were thinking about some album art to, to, to use, uh, we were like, yo, road work. Let's start studying um, the federal the federal traffic control manuals and handbooks. So we're going through there, going through there. We already had the idea for the road work sign, which is the logo for the project. And then we came across the um, road closed to, to through traffic. And it was like, bing. Because in my mind, we had this lyric that came from one of my conversations with the ex-collaborators. And it was, good clothes, the gentrifiers, dig a hole for the motherfuckers creeping on the outliers. So it was me really in a warrior space, you know what I mean? When we saw that sign, road clothes and through traffic, it's like, bing, good clothes and gentrified. So, So we'll ask one more question, and then we'll open it up with a question in the, in the audience. Um, so, I feel like you guys touched on everything that we've had in here. Um, but the idea here was convergence. Um, and we talked about we talked about art that isn't necessarily in a gallery space, um, coming into a gallery space or um the breaking of a glass ceiling. Um what does that statement mean to you like to break a glass ceiling? Should I honestly be able to think about it tonight? So, with you, so, with, um, so a lot of times the glass in it is like a, it's like a level that, like, there's a level that you can reach, and it's like you can't go past that level. Um, so with you as an artist, do you feel like you're making art that can help break that glass in, or is there a reason why do you think you guys are any of these? Is, is there a reason why you think the glass in like exists? Um, or what puts cracks in the glass? Ceiling? I think the glass ceiling exists because of control, but it's rather because it's a glass ceiling, so it's meant to be broken. I feel like uh, just this conversation, this talk here right now has really put like an image of what that glass ceiling is. You know, like I never really uh because I've just been looking at convergence, like a like I read the line, you feel me, like in the show, but convergence has stood out more than breaking glass ceiling. But yeah, now just really sitting here right now, I can 
I can see that we're breaking that ceiling. Like this process, like, you know, this show, um, it's a really, it's a great way to show like just different minds, but we're all moving aligned as well. So uh, I think just with consistency of that, we'll break the glass ceiling for sure. Um, I think that whether it's through my work or just my daily life in general, I've understood that there's a there's these dynamics of um, power and control, and that's rich versus the poor. There's always this duality um, and this aspect of one controlling the other. Um, and I think you can see that obviously in society. Um, you can also see that within yourself and how society has implemented that within ourselves. And so there's this aspect of control that exists with, within your own body and energy system and mind. And you can either decide if you want to let it continue to drive your journey or whether you would like to take back the wheel and drive the journey yourself. And I think that's something, um, a thing that constantly comes up with my work and just how I live my life, whether I want to see the glass ceiling or pretend that I don't see it. Um, and I decide that if you want to stay under it or see what's over it by breaking through it. So I decided to break it through. <laughs> hey, um, the glass ceiling, going back to the context, that, that exists within the context of this social order, this particular social white prioritizing social order. It, it's the glass ceiling only exists if you place yourself in that institutional space and you allow yourself to be uh, unsubmissive Subordinate to something else. So that's 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 a real thing. Many of our people, uh, not many of our people, many people, period, not just our, all our global human back. Many of us put uh think that the only way to have scalable success or scalable impact, or even just like social mobility, economic mobility, is to place ourselves in a structure that already exists. Well, that structure that already exists was architected in a particular way. So yeah, boom, those ceilings are gonna be there for real, for real. Uh, and some can take up the sewer rights fight of breaking those ceilings if they want, yet everything comes with that. For real, you put yourself in that space. So for me, my conversation is more about building your own fucking building, like create your own infrastructure. And then the ceilings are 20 feet tall and they could be removable, you know, you whatever you want, you know what I mean? But let's practice more and more affirming for ourselves. I can make my own thing where there are no ceilings. Yeah, you know I mean, and my floor, my foundation can start from the staff for real quick. Good. I appreciate you all. Let's talk a little bit.